Good morning, folks. And welcome to worship, those of you who are gathered here in the sanctuary and those who will be tuning in from home or some other place this evening or during the week. It's good to be back with you. Um, I'm recognizing some faces, so that's always a good thing. My name is Heather McDougall, and I'm a retired United Church minister, and I live in Argyle Shore. And um, sometimes I kind of dread, you know, heading out at 8 in the morning on the winter roads, but gosh, this morning was a beautiful, beautiful morning, so it was a, a delight to come this way. There are a few announcements in the bulletin. Uh, I noticed that your um, annual meetings are coming up. When I was in full-time ministry, I used to say, you know, there was Advent and Christmas season, and then there was annual meeting season, and then there was Lent. And it sort of seems like its own season and multi-point charges. So there's one tomorrow evening here, Biddeford's, Time Valley's the next evening, Tuesday night, and lot 16, the 26th, um, I don't know what night that is. Wednesday, maybe? Thursday. Thursday, okay. Better not get you confused. Okay. And you'll see the, the places there and then your pastoral charge annual meeting. And I see John was collecting some annual reports this morning and uh, would, would like others to be sent to him. Should we have a storm tomorrow? We'll have to take another uh, we'll try to make some phone calls or something. Okay, we are hearing that if there's a storm, which we're, yeah, you folks are to get snow, we're to get rain, <laughs> snow and rain, so I'm enjoying the, the snow as we have it. The bulletins for the month of January are dedicated to the glory of God and in loving memory of Lehman and Marion Campbell by Doris Gillis. Patterson McCall by Glenn and David Noy. Patterson McCall, Byron Hutchinson, and Verna Roy by Helen and Elmer Hutchinson and family. Winston Grigg by Irma, Jean, Rowena, and families. Michelle Gallant by Irma Ellis and family. William Trousdale by Wayne and Jones. We give thanks for these lives and these people and their place in your life and in the life of the communities of faith in this area. We continue in the season of Epiphany when we celebrate the light of Christ that continues to spread and grow. We hear how it's spreading and growing through the gospel stories that we read during these weeks. And we feel it spreading and growing in our own lives. So we light this candle to remind us that the light of Christ is here. It's among us. And it dwells within us. Whether we are here for worship or whether we are in our own space, the light of Christ dwells within us. Our call to worship is printed in the bulletin, and it comes from a song of faith, which I'm sure some of you have heard. Uh, a song of faith is, uh, I was going to say, the newest affirmation of faith from the United Church. And that's true, although when I looked it up, it was adopted in 2006. I would have said it was adopted six years ago, not, uh, not uh, 16 years ago. Um, it's a very long, uh, a very long document, not like the creed, a creed which we can kind of memorize and get into our hearts and our beings. This is like three pages long. So it's not something that's usually said in worship. Do but like I, the right first? Pardon? Do like the right first? That would be a great <laughs> idea. Thank you for that. <laughs>
deals with worship. And it is written in a very poetic way, and um, so I invite us to, to share in this, uh, this morning. We sing thanksgiving. We offer worship and send pouring of gratitude and awe, and the practice of opening ourselves to God's still, small voice of comfort, to God's rushing whirlwind of challenge. Through word, music, art, and sacrament, in community and in solitude, God changes our lives, our relationships, and our world. Grateful for God's loving action, we cannot keep from singing. And our opening hymn is on page 120 in Voices United with a joyful noise. <laughs> Together. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Having you, a lot of different uh, ministers while Te Reverend Terry Ann is away, and I know you'll be happy to see her when she comes back, and she will be happy to see you. I know that. But um, but I got to see some of you way back in the fall when you were in church with your Halloween costumes on. Some of you were here that day, weren't you? And you went to the manor. And, uh, and visited some people. This morning I just want to share a story with you um, that I like. It's, I, love, I love books and um, this one is called Whoever You Are and it talks about whoever we are we're kind of the same even though there's some differences. Whoever you are, wherever you are, there are people all around the world that look just like you. Well, their skin may be a bit different than yours, and their homes may be different from yours. Some really, really tall apartment buildings there, which we don't see around here very much. Their schools may be different from yours. Don't see many computers there. And their lands may be different from yours. And the way that they worship may be different from yours. Their lives may be different from yours. And the words that they say, the languages they speak, may be very different from yours. But inside, their hearts are the same as yours. Whoever they are, wherever they are, all over the world, their smiles are like yours. And they laugh just like you. Ha, 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 ha. Big belly laugh sometimes. Their hearts are like yours. And they cry like you too and they worship the same God you do. Wherever they are, whoever they are, all over the world. When you are older and when you are grown, you will be different than you are now. And they may be different. They will have grown up too. Wherever you are, wherever they are, in this big wide world. But remember this, joys are the same and love is the same. Pain is the same and blood is the same when we hurt, when, when, when we get hurt. Smiles are the same and hearts are just the same. Wherever they are, wherever you are, wherever all of us are, all over the world, we are the same. 
And I like that book because it just helps us to see that even though some things are different, as the book says, we're the same inside. We have the same hearts and we have the same, the same sadnesses and we have the same joys. So it's a good reminder to us. And the, and the part that's the best in all of that is that whoever we are and wherever we are, God is with us. And God is with people all over the world, no matter the color of, of their skin or the languages they speak or the way that they live or the farms that they live on. God is with all of us. So could we have a prayer together? We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you, God, for friends, here and far away. And we thank you for our Sunday school and our church. Amen. Okay, so now you're going to get to go to Sunday school, and we'll see you a little later on. Have a good morning. differences you will note. Now when Jesus heard that John, John the Baptist, had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat, with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Thanks be to God for these words and stories from Scripture.
Don't worry, I'm not forgetting again. I'm not missing them. <laughs> We've just switched things up a little bit. So because the scripture from last week and this week are so similar, I decided that rather than preaching on these scriptures that you heard Wally talk about last Sunday, that I would reflect in a different way by letting some hymns speak to us about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be called by Jesus. So we're going to sing a little more. For many of us, hymns are our entryway, our path into the divine. When I am joyous or sad or anxious, it's often lyrics and music that can soothe my soul or, or uplift me. There's something about the combination of the words and the melodies that touch my heart in a deep way. I love, when I was in full-time ministry, I loved being part of the team that would choose music and choose hymns for worship, and Carl will tell you that I still like doing that. <laughs> Several emails back and forth. What about this? What about that? So this morning I want us to explore some different understandings of what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be called. Cecil Francis Alexander lived in the mid-1800s and wrote more than 400 hymns. In her younger years, she and her sister operated a school for the deaf. She married William Alexander, an Anglican clergyman who later became the Anglican Archbishop for all of Ireland. One week when he was preparing to preach about this very scripture we heard, about the call of Simon, Andrew, James, and John, he asked her to write a hymn that would be suitable for the coming Sunday. Imagine being asked to write a hymn with six day notes. So she wrote, Jesus calls us, or the tumult of our life's wild restless sea. And it's been sung by generations of Christians through the centuries. She wrote this hymn to recognize the calling of those first disciples by the Sea of Galilee. But it also was intended for people in her day, in the 1800s, mid-1800s, to take some time to reflect on their own faith and how they were called to follow and love. And I would say it continues to do the same for us today. One writer has said, the hymn therefore acknowledges Jesus' claim, not only over the lives of those first four disciples, but over the lives of every Christian. So as we sing this hymn, I ask you to notice if there's a phrase or an image that catches your attention, that speaks to you. Is there an invitation in this song for you today. It's number 562 in Voices United, Jesus Calls Us for the Tumult, 562.
with you through these next days. I was in theological college, which would have been the mid, early to mid-80s, when I first heard the, the hymn, We Have This Ministry, written by Jim and Jean Strafty. For over 40 years, the Strathdees, who live in California, have shared their ministry, their music, in worship, services, retreats, conferences, large and small events, in many places around the world, including often here in Canada. I've had the privilege of being at a couple of those events. Have you ever witnessed them in person, Carl? I don't remember that they vented the island. I connected with them more on the West Coast and, um, and in Central Canada. Their music came more to the attention of the United Church in the 80s and 90s. Several of their pieces are in Voices United and More Voices. The in introit I almost missed this morning, I am the light of the world. That's, that's their song, as well as what does the Lord require of you, and dance with the spirit early in the morning. During the pandemic, they offered recordings and YouTube videos, made new ones, revised former ones, and offered those freely, without cost, with great generosity for any congregation across the United Church particularly, you know, when we weren't able to meet in person and people were doing things from home and offices and basements and empty churches. <coughs> and quite a few people use their music to augment a worship service. And I expect they, off they offered that to the United Church, but I expect to many other denominations as well. The intent of their music is that it be sung by congregations. They're not about writing or composing their music so they can perform it. But for them, it's all about people participating, having that experience of singing together. They say their songs, quote, are a musical offering of hope and encouragement for all people, bringing a message of compassion, justice, and healing." Unquote. We Have This Ministry was written in the 70s, when the involvement of the laity was steadily increasing within our churches. And we became more aware that ministry was more than what just the ministers did. Ministry was what we all did. Even though our biblical stories are full of ordinary people being called to act and to lead, like the fishers in our story, gospel story today, over time a professional ministry had developed where only properly educated ministers and priests could could do certain things. While that has changed a lot in our time and tradition, much of that belief still lingers. Listen to the words from this hymn. Brothers, sisters, clergy, lay, call to service by your grace. Different cultures, different gifts, the young and old a place. In the 70s, different cultures, different gifts, the young and old place. Being a follower of Jesus is for all of us, not just some of us. Not just those of a certain age or education or race or economic class. We have this ministry, the song says. We have this ministry. The experiences of love and hope and compassion and healing and justice are the work of the whole body of Christ. Everyone's gifts, diverse gifts, are needed to live out Christ's ministry 
in our world. So as we sing, we have this ministry, I ask you to notice again if there's a phrase, a line, an image that draws you in. Is there an invitation for you in this song? It's number 510, we have this ministry, 510. <laughs> hymns, and it's an interesting thing with this hymn, is the way it's written, 
the stanzas, the verses are from the perspective of God. I the Lord of sea and sky. I the God of wind and rain. And the chorus, the response is by the people. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? And we notice a bit of a shift happening that in these couple hymns I'm going to talk about, we've moved a little bit from the sense of we have this ministry to it being kind of a more personal focus. Here I am, send me. Another one of those hymns is Jesus, you have come to the lake shore. And I would have used that one this week, but while I used it last week. So. <laughs> These hymns reflect a shift in theology, a shift in understanding God, a shift in the meaning of call and discipleship. Not only this shift from kind of being part of a community to being an individual being called, being sent. But the writers have also moved from speaking about Jesus in the third person, like Jesus calls us, or the tumult. Jesus is out there calling <coughs> us. They've shifted from that to speaking to Jesus. Jesus, you have come to the lake shore. With your eyes you have searched me. And while smiling, you have spoken my name. By your side, I will seek other seas. Just like those early fishers did. Do you hear the shift? It's purposeful. The intent is to invoke a, a closer, deeper relationship between the holy and humanity. And that closeness is not always revealed in the older hymns. While there might be great pomp and great uh, power in the music and the words, the older hymns generally speak of God being kind of far away, an entity removed from us. Often up there, praise God in heaven. But in these newer hymns, well, newer, 80s and 90s, God, Jesus, Spirit, are as close to us as our own breathing, our own speaking. With your eyes, you have searched me. The choir is going to sing a hymn for us that is part of this same genre one which reflects a different sense of the relationship between the divine and us. I have called you by your name. You, you are mine. Could be individual or plural. Here it is, the Holy One, speaking to us. It's not a hymn about us speaking about God, it's the Holy speaking to us, speaking such tender words about the people, about us, about you, about me. Such tender words of being named and called being beloved. As they sing, and I think we could follow along if you'd like, that's okay, it's in more voices, the other, the soft covered, more voices, one, six, one. As they sing and we listen, <laughs> Again, listen for a phrase or an image that pulls us into its embrace, or into the embrace of the divine. It's more voices, one, six, one.
Thank you. It's become another faith for many of us. Daniel Charge Damon, Charles Damon is the writer and composer of this hymn. He's another one of these composers who are still living and still writing. None of his hymns are in Voices United, but 13 of his hymns are in More Voices. It just shows the way hymnody and words and music have, uh, have changed and not only changed but really expanded. Interesting note, he's an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church in the States, and he's a jazz pianist as well. So he plays in churches and conferences and worship events, and he plays jazz and jazz events. Our last hymn comes to us from the Iona community, which is a Christian community based on the Isle of Iona, off the west coast of Scotland. Do I remember you telling me you were there? Carl and I talked after, the, after one of our services to discover we had traveled to some similar places. Iona is a very tiny island. It's what the Celts call a thin place, where earth and heaven mingle where mystery and humanity come together. I've had the privilege, too, of being a pilgrim to this island on two occasions. And I can attest to the deep sense of spirituality that resides in the whole island, the land, the buildings, the seas. John Bell, is one of the more well-known composers and speakers within the Iona community. Even though this little island is on the <coughs> west coast of Scotland, the Iona community is made up of members, people from around the world. This past summer, John Bell was the minister in residence of Berwick Camp. And we got to go there for a few days and got to experience and hear him. A few years after he was ordained in the Church of Scotland, he took a position with the Iona community. He and his colleague, Graham Mall, began to broaden the youth ministry that was taking place there by focusing on the renewal of the church's worship. His approach soon turned to composing songs that began to address concerns that he felt were missing from the Scottish hymnal. In an interview a number of years ago, he said, I discovered that seldom did our hymns represent the plight of poor people to God. There was nothing that dealt with unemployment, nothing that dealt with living in a multicultural society and feeling disenfranchised, nothing there was nothing about child abuse. There was nothing that reflected concern for the developing world, nothing that helped see ourselves as brothers and sisters to those who are suffering from poverty or persecution. He endeavored to create hymns that would speak to the realities of life, not only for youth, but for adults as well. And again, many of his hymns and the of hymns of the Iona community are in Voices United and More Voices. And one that has become significant to many is that little chorus, Don't Be Afraid. My love is stronger. My love is stronger than your fear. Don't be afraid. My love is stronger. And I have promised, promised to be always near. Again, it's that sense of God speaking to us. The one that we will sing shortly is, Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? It's a question, an invitation. Will you? Will you come and follow me? It's not a command. 
Following in the ways of Jesus is always a choice. Others might nurture and mentor us and be lights along the path for us. But ultimately, each of us makes our own decision to follow, to respond. This hymn tells us, as do the Gospels, that if we respond positively to this invitation, life will never be the same. We will never be the same. Those words are echoed in every stanza of this hymn. Like those first disciples who left their boats to follow Jesus of Nazareth, I wonder how our lives are impacted when we choose to listen and turn and follow. Become active participants in the kingdom of God. As we sing this last hymn in our time of reflection, I ask, I ask you, I ask myself to listen for an invitation that is just for you this day. Will you come and follow me? It's number 567 in Voices United. 567. Thank you. Get that with all the words. 
but I invite us to share in this affirmation. We sing of God's new gift, a church with births, faith nurtured and hearts comforted. It is shared for the good of all. Resistance to the forces that exploit and marginalize. Fierce love in the face of violence. Human dignity defended. Members of community held and inspired by God. Corrected and comforted. Instrument of the loving spirit of Christ. Creation's mending. We sing of God's mission. One of the ways that Gonna go to offer prayers first. So I invite us to uh, come together in in prayer. God, you come close to us as we come close to you. In you, we live and move and have our being. And in us and through us, you move and live and love. We give thanks for the opportunity to worship, for the gifts of songs and music that stir us, for words and prayers that comfort, for affirmations that stir and challenge. We thank you this day for the beautiful blanket of snow, for the protection and life this gives animals, for what it offers to people sometimes opportunities for play and recreation, sometimes pauses to go inward. We give thanks for Tara Ann and Max and Hunter and Quinton as they continue to reform their family during this maternity leave. We give thanks for these congregations, this pastoral charge, as you continue to share in leadership and worship, in ministry and in outreach. We are aware that in the midst of this week of prayer for Christian unity, we do long to be united with sisters and brothers from other denominations, other countries, and we pray that you will help us to look for the similarities, to look for the ways that our hearts and our smiles and our pains and our faith and our longings are the same. We pray this day for many, for those who are struggling to make ends meet. We pray for those who work within our health care system and who are feeling such stress and sometimes attacks. We pray for all who are living with illnesses of mind and spirit and body those waiting for surgery, those recovering from surgery, for any coping with death and grief, for people living in violent and unsafe places. For those who are living in the midst of war 
forced to flee their homes and their jobs and their families. In this moment of silence, we offer prayers for those close to us, those far away, and ourselves. Help us to be carriers of your light. Help us to be agents of your good news lived out. Grateful for your loving action, we cannot keep from singing and living. Amen. And now we will share in our offering that has been put on the plates or has been offered through par. Those financial gifts, yes, but all the other gifts that we give in the daily living of our lives. Prayers and hope and food and compassion. Our offerings will be received. Thank you. 